Hello, and welcome to Believe TV. My name is Bruce Sampson, and I'm your host. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me. Um, it's going to be a fun time. For those of you who have never tuned in before, this is an interactive space. And uh, basically, what I like to do here is sometimes it's just me, but oftentimes I love to have guests on, folks that I can talk to that I find interesting and inspiring. And uh, today is that in spades. I'm super, super excited. Uh, to have the guests that we're going to have on. But please know that if you're watching us, especially on Facebook, that you can uh, kind of join the conversation. If you have questions you want to ask or comments you want to make, or you just want to say, hi, I'm watching you from wherever you happen to be, we welcome that. And I usually go back later and and uh, answer any questions if people have questions or, or reply to comments. So again, just know that it, it is an interactive forum and we uh, encourage that. Okay. So my guest today, I've been wanting to talk to this lady forever um, and and just pick her brain about a lot of different things. And so today I get to indulge that and I'm super, super excited. Um, I in doing the intro, like normally I write out like a little thing and say, well, this person is this and this and this. OK, she's so accomplished that I'm going to cheat. And so I'm going to bring this on screen and I'm just going to go through this because it's it's a lot easier uh, to just show it to you and tell you at the same time. My guest today is Sherry Steinkellner. Uh, she's won so many awards, four Emmys, two Golden Globes, Writers Guild, People's Choice, World Animation, BAFTA Awards, Tony nominee for Sister Act, Indie Award, Ovation nominee. And that's just a few, right? We haven't we even touched the surface yet. And then she's I feel like, you know, associated with these shows, Cheers, The Jeffersons, The Facts of Life, I spelled it wrong, Benson, <laughs> Who's the Boss, Family Ties, and Disney's Teacher's Pet, again, just to name a few. Uh, I am so excited to welcome to the program uh, the incredible Miss Sherry Steinkellner. And uh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, Sherry. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Oh. It's it's all you. <laughs> you know, some of it's a little old, so I'd forgotten. So thanks for the reminder. <laughs> you know, I um, so I want to start this off just a little bit uh, for your benefit and for the benefit of those who are watching, to know uh, that a lot of the guests that I'll have on sometimes are are close friends that I've worked with in, in my youth or you know, whatever, and most of them are, are affiliated with the Young Americans. Um, so we are both affiliated with young americans so that's how we know each other um but we're not but i can't really say that like we perform together or we or we know each other that closely right um but this is my chance to get to know you <laughs> a, a little better so um if we could could we just start with um the beginning like where are you from and family life you know school all that stuff i am third generation californian born and raised and, and have never left. Um, oh. And so uh, I went to I went to school in Orange County, California, Fullerton, and um, joined the Young Americans just out of high school when I was in college, when you didn't have to be one of the best people in your choir, because I wasn't even in my choir. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, I joined in uh, 19... I want to say it was fall of... 73 and uh, and so i was in the young american few years until 1976 and um but still as you well know once and all once a YA, always a YA. always yeah absolutely so so tell me about your family though like what was your family dynamic or like a creative family and all in the arts or I come from the housing industry. My dad was an architect. My mom was an interior designer. My brother is an artist. He's a photographer and a, an innovator. I, I, that's the best way I can describe him. Um, but uh, in fact, I don't know that I would have made it into the performing arts um, if I hadn't been so introverted and shy. I wanted to just draw all the time. And somewhere around my sophomore year in high school, my parents and my um, guidance counselor at school got together and decided I needed to come out of my shell and talk to people. And so they made me take speech. Um, and as part of the, the forensics class, you had to participate in a tournament. 
And um, I went to one of these speech tournaments in Orange County, California. And to everyone's shock, most of all my own, I won a small plastic trophy. And then my name was on the morning announcements. And I had, for the first time, an identity uh, with other people in, in the world. And, um, and it just all kind of grew out of that, I would say. I always loved uh, musicals. I was very much an audience member. But I never imagined that somebody like me would have a voice uh, or a face or anything that anybody would want to see or hear. Wow. So, so tell me, where did you, where did the writing start? Uh, that was interesting. So I got off on that track in high school and pursued it in college while I was in the Young Americans. Um, or while I was in college, I was in the Young Americans. And, uh, you know, I mean, they say go where the love is. I, that was where the love was. That was where the fun was. And I just followed it. So I thought I was supposed to be a performer and I was doing well at it. Um, but then I began dating um, a man who is now my husband, lo, these many years later. Um, and he was a writer. Um, I should have known there was an early, there were early indicators that I might become a writer. For example, I went to college as a theater major, go where the love is. Um, but I found myself migrating over to the English department. And I ended, I started as a theater major and ended up with a degree in English. Um, and with an emphasis on creative writing. But I still didn't get the clue. I didn't get the clue until um, I was in my mid-20s, and my husband had an idea for a play, but he, or my boyfriend at the time, and he didn't really, he didn't really know how to write it. And I said, oh, well, I'll help you. I can type. Uh, and I thought I was just typing, but I was doing more than typing. I was writing, too. Um, we ended up completing that play, sharing it with our neighbors and friends, and all of us, you know, kind of Judy and Mickey style, hey, kids, let's put on a show. We knew someone who had a theater who would let us put it on after hours, like at 1030 at night. And um, and we ended up putting on the show, and we were, I, I, was, um, I was in it. I was doing box office and press and publicity. And I mean, that's how we did in those days. You do everything. <laughs> yeah. um, and one night on stage, and, but, but we had also written it together. My husband and I had written it together. Boyfriend, sorry. Uh, at the time. Um, and so um, I was on stage one night and I had one of those kind of choir of angels sing moments uh, where you go out of body and have this experience where somebody that I was on stage with got a laugh from the audience with a line that I had thought of. And I realized in this moment of true clarity, that laugh meant more to me than any line that came out of my own mouth that I hadn't thought of. Wow. wow. And I realized, well, I want to be the one who puts the words in the mouth, not the, not the mouth that they come out of. Wow, that's fascinating. That's truly fascinating. Okay, so so then let me let's go let's go through your young American experience. Like, what were some of the highlights of your time in the group? Like projects that you did. I was I oh God I was so lucky. I got into the Young Americans at a moment where we were doing television, the Bing Crosby Show with Fred Astaire. Um, you know. Um, flying across the country for a weekend jaunt to sing for the president. I sang, I want to be loved by you, just you, to President Ford uh, when he became an honorary Eagle Scout. Um, you know, just running through the back kitchens of the Biltmore Hotel to get on stage. I, I mean, you know, there were just so many amazing um, memorable experiences working on the Tomorrowland stage at Disneyland and being backstage at Disneyland. Um, it was such, th those are the kind of the performing related memories, the friend related memories, uh, you know, the people that I met in the Young Americans, as you mentioned earlier, are, have turned out to be 
all these years later, <laughs> my friends for life. And yeah. it's amazing to, you know, to go away and have these whole lives for decades and still be able to connect over something that was so meaningful to us at such a meaningful time. Yeah. Well, okay, so, so tell me this. Um, in my research, <laughs> limited uh, as it is, as it was, um, I came across something that looks like you had an association with or affiliation with the Groundlings. I did. That's where I met Bill, my boyfriend slash husband. Um, yeah, I uh, also just out of college and just out of the Young Americans, um, I was working as a page at NBC um, in Burbank, beautiful downtown Burbank. Right. Um, I was ushering on the Gong Show with Chuck Barris, wow. and um, uh, one of the contestants show that day um, after I was finished doing my ushering and the audience had left and I was picking up trash in the aisles he came out with his you know wardrobe bag over his shoulder and I just said oh you're really funny you're really good um, can I see you anywhere he said oh yeah well I work out with the groundlings and you know this is I think 1977 or 78 and I'm going work out like I, I thought he meant like exercise with and, and <laughs> any of these words mean in that context but anyways long story short he explained to me what improv was i never i did not know what this was making, you know getting suggestions and making things up but i said that sounds well we're having auditions um on saturday if you want to come and it's like i was an actress at the time i would audition for anything so long story short that person turned out to be Paul Rubens, who is um, also known as Pee Wee Herman, who did the Pee Wee Herman show, which Bill, my husband, um, co-wrote and directed at the Groundlings and then later on Broadway, 30 years later on Broadway. Wow. Um, so yeah, I have all these stories that sound kind of like, now that I tell them, they're like, that didn't really happen, but that really did happen. So I went and I went to the Groundlings, um, it turned out that, you know, in my in my lonely life of solitude as a child, before my parents made me take speech, um, playing and pretending was something I learned to do quite well. Um, and so improv came very naturally to me. And I just thought it was the most amazing thing that um, all of these grown people played together nicely. And I just, and again, like, like with the young Americans, the groundlings that I met in the late seventies, I was down improvising with them yesterday. You know, pe people. I improvise with them and they're still playing together nicely. So I've been not going to really manifest really lucky. Wow. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I didn't know the Pee Wee Herman thing. That's cool. <laughs> That's very, very cool. <laughs> so um, I guess my next question um, is, as a writer, what is your preference? Like, do you prefer, um, since you've done, you know, so much TV, uh, do you prefer writing for... Um, already established characters, or or do you prefer creating your own, you that's, know, world and characters and all that? That's a that's a really great question to ask a writer, because there are really advantages to both, um, and I think it depends. I can only speak for myself, but in my writer's life. Um, writing for established characters was a fabulous way to begin. Um, you're still, you're still living in the world of your imagination, actively living in imagination to think of what the story and the situation is going to be and how these characters are going to respond to it, but you've got their voices in your ear. And so when you're in, you know, early in your, in your writing life, it's, it was easier earlier in my writing life, it was easier for me to hear 
established voices um, and to and to picture, um, for example, I, one of the shows that where I cut my teeth and grew up was the TV show Cheers. Billy and I started as baby writers and ha hung in there for seven years and became what is now called showrunners of the show. And to have the voices of characters and actors like Ted Dance and Rhea Perlman, Shelley Long, Kirstie Alley, B.B. Newworth, and her, to have them in our ears um, so useful. You, you, could, you could imagine what they would say in any game. Um, nowadays, I like creating. Um, I like I like listening to the voices in my head, and you know, just giving them free reign to go wild. So I've gone and and similarly in television, it's such a big project. Um, you know, writing and running a TV show that you're working in a group almost all of the time. You need that kind of support and um, many minds to solve so many problems so quickly um, and tell so many stories in, in such a condensed amount of time. Um, and so I did that for many years. Now, once again, I if there's voices in my ears and voices in my head, they start thing. And so I prefer um, in my bed, which I call my office, with the covers pulled up <laughs> in just kind of like, wave of wonders um, where I can really close my eyes and, and close my ears and watch and hear it in my imagination and then type it. Wow. Yeah. Well, okay. So as a kid, the first, my first recollection of, of understanding that the things I was watching on TV and the movies I was seeing, that there were people behind that who were writing the words and, and you know, and creating that was, watching the Dick Van Dyke show back in the day, right? Yes, and, sir. And my concept of, of the writer's room was Dick and Sally and Buddy, you know, coming up with stuff for the Alan Brady show, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, so, so that's my view. <laughs> um, it's still all these many years of what, of what that's like. Uh, can, can you let us in inside the room and tell us what is the writing room like? Um, ideally, it's like that, you know, the, you're stuck for a joke and Rob Petrie just gets up and acts it out and it's there. <laughs> um, now that's, I mean, and, and your image, you're spot on. Um, and I'm surprised you're not a comedy writer having grown up with all of that, Bruce. Um, but that, that's how most of us got into the game. We watched, we watched them have fun and thought, I want to have that kind of fun. I want to make people laugh and do talent shows and, you know, <laughs> play. And so um, that was that was the dream. Um, the reality is uh, you're working with a lot of different personalities and egos and a very, and a ticking clock. And we all have different ways of, attacking a problem and trying to solve it. And sometimes those different ways step on each other. So the what's behind all of the fun is having to figure out and negotiate how to create, there are a bunch of very creative people to create in collaboration, how to listen as well as speak, and um, how to share, how to give and take, how to read the room. Um, and you end up with just a huge spectrum of situations from everybody talking at once to a showrunner going, everybody, may I have the room or they leave the room and just go quietly by themselves. Um, uh, any creative collaboration, I'm working in musical theater now and that's a mighty creative collaboration. Um, is uh, both extraordinarily rewarding and extraordinarily fraught. Hmm. So a big part of the game is figuring out how to work with all the different personalities and, um, and, and get the job done. Wow. 
and then so, so ask uh, ask me so uh, riddle me this um, when working on a show like Cheers or or any other sitcom let's say um, how much interaction do you have with the actors and and how much does that play a part in the stories you're telling great question um again from show to show it varies on cheers cheers was considered very much a writerly collaboration so we were in constant daily communication with the actors we we would go to the stage every day and see what they had put on their feet um and we would and then we would discuss it and um do revisions and rewrites accordingly because ultimately by by the time the audience comes in which is five days after we start with any particular script we have to make it work so the, the actors need to be in cohesion with the writers we need to work together to find the way to make every story and every ideally every line work um and whoever's got to give has to give. So it's really good to have that direct communication. Um, but that was on that show. I've also been on shows where um, the executive producers or showrunners do not want the writing staff adding more voices to the mix. And so there is a kind of quarantine or isolation. Um, it's one of the things, honestly, right now that the Writers Guild is striking for is to give young writers, they're called baby writers, I don't mean to be maternalistic about it, but that's the term, to give starting writers a chance to be on the set and have this kind of interaction so that they can experience or at least see um, what it's all about so that you can grow into showrunners it's wow. really important it, it's I, I mean we're we're striking for many many reasons but the right for those writers to be there during production not just for the writing phase but that the production phase is part of the writing experience is um it's it's, it's a good thing wow so then so now throw the director into the mix and i'm assuming okay and, and correct me if i'm wrong but most of Cheers was all directed by one director, right? Almost all the episodes were directed by the legendary James Burroughs. <laughs> <Who's laughs> honest to God, for a great reason. The man is so skilled and intuitive and such a friend to both the actors and the writers. Um, he's just, he is the best that I've met. Yeah, yeah. And so so then how does that play in terms of um, what you come up with as a writer? The, uh, I'm assuming the director has their own input as well. Yes, and all of that input is happening in television over a very, very condensed, you know, time period. Uh, you right. read the... The show is read out loud for the first time on day one, and it is shot on day five. So we've got days two, three, and four to get from hearing it for the first time to putting it in front of an audience for the last time. Um, although I will say, even though we put it in, with cheers, we put it in front of a live studio audience, like a little play on day five, um, we would still get one more or several more passes at it because we do a lot of revision and one of my favorite revisions rewrites is um, editing and doing it in post. So after the show has been shot and it's all on film, we're still goofing around and editing and condensing and, and stretching and making it, making things work as best we can. So, but back to your question about um, working with the director in television, you know, you've got the words on the page. Now you've got to get them on the stage. And in a way that they're going to feel natural, it's easy to write a line like, um, you know, somebody says, oh, I'm going to meet you over there. And they're going to cross the entire stage, which is 30 feet long. 
Now you've got, you know, when, once we put it on its feet, we've got to do what we call covering that cross. What are we going to do while that person is getting from point A to point B? Right. So the audience isn't just walk, watching them walk. And these are the kinds of things that, you know, when, when the director puts the actors on their feet, they together start discovering how we're going to fill this. And Jimmy was a master of film. Um, and, and, and where we need to write more words to cover that cross or where we're going to cut the camera away to watch somebody react so that we can condense that time. All of those things that go from taking it off the, off the page and putting it on the screen uh, are where we are relying on the director. Um, so many more things. You know, he's, he's our liaison. He's our interpreter. He is the... Um, what do you call it? The um, what are they? The the wisdom. The um, I can't remember the word right now for it. But he's he's the institutional memory of the show. Jimmy was okay. okay. He holds everything in his head and reminds us, "Oh, we've done this before. Do it again." Or, "Oh, we've never tried this. Let's go further with it." Yeah. Okay. So, I I'm just going to admit it right here. Huge fan of Cheers. Huge, huge. Um, one of my all-time yes. favorite um, shows. And um, before we're done, I'm going to tell you about two different uh, connections to Cheers and you that you may not, okay. you probably don't know. Okay, so. <laughs> um, I'm intrigued. I'm, cur I'm curious to know. Um, well, you know what? Let's 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 deal with that first. So, okay. um, I. I was fortunate enough to be in uh, the audience for one taping of, of Cheers. And I believe it was a season wrap. I'm pretty sure because I know there was an after party um, that because of time, I, I wasn't able to attend. But um, yeah. and I, I remember whatever, whatever this show was, and, and you may recall this, or I don't know if you were around then, but um, the show had to do with a rival bar and Gary's yeah. Bar and Grill. And I remember I Gary's old town. Gary's old town. Oh, town. okay, okay. And I remember sitting um either right next to or, or right in front or right behind uh Judith Light. Because I think that was her boyfriend okay. or husband or, or something. Robert Desiderio, oh, yes. Okay. He was Gary two Gary's and Judith was married to Gary too. Gary too. Okay, okay. <laughs> So see, I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. It really happened. <laughs> that happened. So um, it was truly fascinating. One of the things that was cool for those who who haven't had a chance to go to a TV taping, and I don't know how uh, unusual this may be, but I remember Woody Harrelson coming up during breaks and singing with the band. Like there was a band there, at, right? Okay, yeah. so there to entertain us uh, so how how unusual was that and whose idea was that and well you're in a studio audience and it's different from being in it's because in the theater audience the you know the costume changes are quick and they're always covered but in television sometimes we're doing costume and wig changes and those changes you know the audience can be sitting there for a half hour right. <laughs> before we get to the next, ready to do the next scene um so we need to keep you know everyone happy and the energy high um so a lot of shows these days will have they'll have an entertainer who will have a lot of audience participation and a lot of karaoke and prizes and throwing candy and pizza and all not throwing pizza but offering pizza um but we had a band to keep the energy high and you have an actor like woody who is a showman and he's not off stage making it wear a wig um then um or hair change i should say nobody wore wigs in that um then uh, he was really super gregarious and wanted to come play and have fun. Um, yeah. So I would say it's you were in a special audience and it was very unusual. 
And those are the reasons why we have that kind of entertainment in between times. Gotcha. Okay. So the reason that I was there was because um, we had a number of friends who worked on the Paramount lot on various shows. So this is a question I've always wondered, like, was it just coincidence that you all kind of landed at Paramount? Because there were so many former young Americans who worked there. So we're talking or, or about did you bring each other along. <laughs> Corky Lee and Susie Freeman Johnson, or is is that who you're talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how we all landed there, but we all found each other there and ended up working together there. Susie and, and we worked together on all of our shows. Um, but I don't know how that happened. I think it was just good fortune. Oh, okay, okay. I, I kept thinking, okay, there. This is nepotism or something like they're just bringing <laughs> people along, but that's oh, we, that too. we we would do that too. But no, this was just pure luck. Wow! Wow! Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll go ahead and tell you the other connection. So that was the first connection, right? It was through that. Um, I didn't really remember this until recently, when I went back. Um, I forget which streaming service I was watching, but I decided to watch Cheers from the beginning. And I said, you know, I want to experience this all over again. Let me go back to the very top. So I'm watching the episode and then I remember it. Oh my gosh, this is the episode. So the very first episode, uh, and I'm assuming it was a pilot, I, I, I assume, um, there was a mention of a baseball player that Coach mentions that he's telling a story and he remembers this coach, this baseball player that he didn't like for some reason. Um, and they mention it twice because coach's daughter wants to marry some guy. And um, so, so you were there for all, all of that, right? Oh, no, we came into oh. cheer after, after coach passed, we came in actually with Woody Harrelson in the fourth season. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. We weren't with Woody, but we came in at the same time. Gotcha. Okay. So, okay, so maybe it's not as cool as I thought, but. <laughs> um, it's still cool, Bruce. Um, but I'm, I'm watching the show and the baseball player that was mentioned is my cousin. Are you kidding me? Yeah, Charlie Spikes. Um, wow. Yeah, he, well, he married, he married my cousin, so he's my cousin now. Um, but yeah, and it's, and I've actually asked him about this before and I'm like, okay, do you know that your name was just mentioned on TV? <laughs> like, I remember when it first happened. I'm like, dude, they just mentioned your name on TV. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he said, people were always coming to me and, and having me sign different things. And I would just be, okay, you know, whatever. So I don't know if that was the case, but I just thought that was kind of it's funny. Pretty. The show that I loved and that someone that I had an affiliation with uh, that was affiliated with it, and I had a connection through Young Americans, was all part of that. But so anyway, that someone was a, whoever wrote that was a fan of your cousin. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That's only we only name check people in scripts if we love them or hate them. <laughs> that's funny, because so um, so then let me say that again. I said we only I said we name check people in scripts if we love them, hate them, or gave birth to them. Oh, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, so let's talk about awards. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. So, I, you know, looking at your list of awards that you um, accumulated over the years, can you remember your very first major award that, that you won? Uh, that first Emmy in 1989 uh, was staggering. I, I mean, that's it doesn't get more major than that. And there was no way we were going to win that award that year. Because Cheers had, it, it was the first year that Billy and I and our partner Fief were running the show. We had stepped in midway through the, through the season to become the showrunners. And... Um, we had put up an episode that had been just a very 
like a nightmare episode to shoot because it was one of those where every single night that week, we stayed up all night coming up with an entirely new script. We just couldn't crack it. And so, um, but it was the, it was the episode um, that season that was chosen to represent the entire season when the Emmy judges went to look at the show. So we just didn't think there was any way that the show was going to win. Um, there was another show that year that, you know, had been on the cover of time and was absolutely going to win best comedy um, in that year. So when Milton Berle came to the microphone <laughs> and announced the nominees, we were the only ones, Billy and I were the, every, how do I say this? The rest, all the people above us, the creators of the show and Jimmy Burroughs, I think, were had all, maybe Jimmy was there, I, I can't remember, but they had all already gone over to the after party at La Rangerie. They, had, they didn't come to sit through the awards because we all knew we were... And then Milton Burrell steps up to the mic and he opens the envelope and he announces, like he waits a beat. I can still remember he waits a beat and then he goes, cheers. And it's like, it was, we levitated. We were in the Pasadena Civic Auditorium and I don't even remember getting up or walking. It was so surreal. Um, we received this award and I just, uh, there was nobody else to, to to walk forward. I'm 40 weeks pregnant. I'm wearing a borrowed dress <laughs> because, you know, and I just start babbling. It's just, it was ridiculous. Um, but there we were. So yes, I do remember that. So tell me, and, and this may be way, way before this, but I'm really curious to know you're talking to someone right now who has, um, who suffers from imposter syndrome. <laughs> so no matter what I do, what I accomplish, I still have those moments of any moment now they're going to figure out I'm, I'm a fraud, <laughs> you know, or I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I'm curious to know, as you began your professional writing career, uh, I'm assuming that at some point there was some type of transformation in terms of how you viewed yourself and how you viewed everything around you to the point where it became, well, this is, this is my world. This is what I do now. Um, or, or tell me if I'm wrong. Well, first of all, I would like to say, I can tell from your questions, you are no fraud. <laughs> You're the real deal. You're asking such good apt questions um, that that's, that's real. <laughs> so if I, I, you know, I can't, I, I, I can't change the way you, you might have felt or might feel, but these are real questions. Okay, thank you. Um, the interesting thing about Cheers is when we began working on the show, um, we were at such a low level that we were not even in part of the writer's room. We were just there to be flies on the wall, to observe and to, you know, just like take it in. Um, and we were, we had, we wrote a couple or a few scripts that first year that we were on the show, but we weren't part of the system. And indeed we were not really integrated into things um, until, you know, slowly but surely over the years. Um, so it wasn't until we had actually been observing uh, for quite some time that we were invited to become decision makers and to have a voice. And so by the time, honestly, by the time it became our turn, by the time it was our turn to step up and take the wheel, we were so ready. We were way over, we felt overdue. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, give me that wheel. I know the way. And in fact, I remember one of the show's creators, because we were the first ones who ran it the supervision of our creators. And I remember one of the, the Charles brothers saying to us, uh, so if, um, if we can allay your fears or give you any, because we were just not afraid. We were ready. Wow. Um, 
and so, and I think that the gift that that was the gift of time that we had just been in, in you know cooked for so long that we were baked <laughs> you know we we're ready yeah wow so uh so let me jump ahead a little bit to how did you go from all that television to uh sister act or, or was there something that preceded that there was there they're, they're between. Uh, so I love musicals all my life. Like musicals are, you know, they, they were the second language in my house, you know? <laughs> I mean, albums were always playing. We were always going, I lived in Fullerton. We were always going next door to Anaheim Melody Land Theater to see whatever, yes. you know, little production happening in the round. Um, uh, so that was always what I imagined was the happy place, uh, writing musicals. Um, so we, ooh, gosh, there's, there's a few steps and I don't want to make this too long. Um, to shorten it, we ended up after Cheers writing a couple more shots and then leaving LA to raise our children in Santa Barbara. And we got a call from somebody at Disney Animation um, inviting us to write an animated Saturday morning comedy, huge pay cut, but a lot of freedom and we could do it from Santa Barbara. And our children were the right age where writing a Saturday morning cartoon was meaningful to oh. family. So we wrote a TV show called Teacher's Pet, Disney's Teacher's Pet, and, and we cast Nathan Lane in the lead. Broadway epic Nathan Lane. Right. And when you have Nathan Lane in your cartoon playing a little blue dog who wants to go to the fourth grade, what are you going to do? Not write songs? You have to write songs. You have to make Nathan sing, right? Right. You have to be big, fun, funny numbers, right? <laughs> so, um, so that's how we got into the musical biz. It was because of Disney and Teacher's Pet. And at the same time, Tom Schumacher, who was... Um, very involved in the um, film side at Disney, the animated film side, but also significantly was running Disney theatricals. Uh, and they had um, Beauty and the Beast and Lion King, and they were looking to expand their catalog, not just with the Disney brand shows, but with other shows, other titles that had been made under the Disney-related um, umbrella. Oh. And Buena Vista was one of them and Sister Act was a Buena Vista property. So they had us look at their catalog and say, you know, what here appeals to you? And uh, so Billy's Catholic, I'm, you know, my religion is musicals. And we said, Sister Act. <laughs> so that's how we got to Sister Act. That's the shortest version. Right, right. Okay, so for the benefit of the audience and for me, <laughs> can you, explain either the process or what it's like uh, going from, so movie already exists, popular, all that stuff. You have to look at that and then determine, transfer that to something that will go on stage, which I assume often uh, will include um, additions or changes in storyline, you know, in, in, whatever. So can you kind of talk through like what that's like and yes, you know, one part or <laughs> right now with another um, movie title taking a, um, a movie title from actually this one is from 1950. It's the old Judy Garland, Gene Kelly um, movie musicals called Summerstock. And I'm involved in taking that from screen to stage. And it's extraordinarily different. Um, the in, in both the case of Sister Act, which I'll, I'll use as the example, and Summerstock, it's as if you're starting with the same framework, but you're writing an entirely different medium, and therefore you, you've got different priorities. I'll give you a really good example in Sister Act. What you can do in a movie that you cannot do in a Broadway theater or a West End theater is close-ups. And if you look at the film Sister Act, 
you've got a lot of close-ups. Whoopi Goldberg, Kathy Najimy, Wendy McKenna, Maggie Smith. So even though they're all wearing pretty much the same thing that covers their hair and part of their faces and their entire bodies. Right. You can, we always know who we're with because you can pull that camera in close. Right. On stage, what we're seeing is a whole whole of nuns wearing habits. And that's a lot of black and white and very little face and no hair. So you can't say the, the redhead or the brunette. You've really got to now distinguish the characters with their voices attitudes in, in a much more definitive way. So that we, you know, so that when you've got a whole room full of nuns, a stage, a, a line of nuns across the front of the stage, one of them speaks, you know which one is, even if you're in the second balcony, back there and you can't see. Okay? Wow. That's a biggie. Um, the other thing we had to do was really, you've got to make room for a lot more music. In any movie musical, you'll have maybe five, six, seven numbers. In a stage musical, you'll have twice that sometimes in the first act. You've got to, you've got to make room for a lot of music. So you've got to tell your story very efficiently. And you've got to keep that story going through songs. So you can't stop to have a song like, I Will Follow Him. You've got to, keep, you've got to be at every moment either illuminating character or furthering the story um with the song so it really is a i was gonna say it really is a dance (laughs) putting (laughs) the scene really is a dance (laughs) wow incredible i'm i'm gonna kind of dip back to something i asked you a second ago and and take a little bit deeper dive of it so I'm I'm curious to know, like, so from from my vantage point, I look at your life and I look at your career and the things you've done and the people you inter- interact with, who to me are these far off, you know, stars on you know, they're you know unreachable, right? <laughs> unreachable, untouchable, whatever. Um, but for you, that's that's your your world, your universe. These and, and these are your friends and people that you interact with. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious to know, um, is, is any of this ever surreal for you? Like, are there ever moments that you stop and go, what is happening or how did I get here? (laughs) Yes, there are. There are moments where you imagined something in your head, typed it into a document and then hear it read for the first time. And that, that, that's the exact feeling is what is happening? How can this be? How can something that was just part of imagination be reality yeah. now? I mean, I'm living that right now. I've got um, Corbin Blue is going to be starring in the role that Gene Kelly originated in, in Sister Act. And I mean, I'm like, how is this happening? <laughs> because all the time I was writing the script and living in my imagination, I was also watching his YouTubes and going, oh man, if only we had somebody with that, you know, charm and muscle and talent who could sing like that and dance like that. And here he is. How does wow. that happen? Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, so I so we have a few minutes left. Um, I mentioned to you uh, before we came on that I wanted to play a little game with you. Um, so are you ready to try that out? Let's do it. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you can see this. I um, can. You can. Okay, great. So. Ah. <laughs> does what? that mean anything to you or? Um, you know what I always associate with the Crosby Christmas show is doing the Freddy. Time oh. for living. <laughs> <laughs> is that what that's called? I, I never knew the name for it. How but fun. so I mean, just seeing Roy Leake's face next to mine, rest in peace. I'm just yeah. so. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's what's really funny. Well, not funny, but interesting about 
this too, because again, in my brain, our young American journeys, I felt were very far apart from each other. Because, you know, we, um, my first summer in Petoskey working with Young Americans was 1979. Okay. Yeah. I, so was I, I, I auditioned in 78 and went to work with them in 79. And I just looking on this thing, it said 75 that you shot that show. So I'm like, oh, we're not that far removed. Plus, I knew Roy. My very first summer, Roy, uh, I think he played Tevia when we did Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, I wish and, I'd seen that. Oh, my gosh. Um, and just an amazing human being. Uh, and so as soon as I saw that, I went, oh, we're a lot closer than I thought we were. You know, we're a lot more connected time-wise. Um, so anyway, so. Also, I, hi, Holly Hancock and Steve Scott. I'm just all friends, I'm, you know, we're still oh. Facebook friends. So it's nice to see my buddies. Wait, that's Holly Hancock? No, no, that's Aaron Donovan. Holly was on that show, but that's Aaron Donovan. Oh, over there. oh how funny. Okay. Because <laughs> I've worked with Holly before, too. That's yeah. funny. Okay. Um, okay. So, skip me ahead. Oh, that's Pink Lady and Jeff. That's Jeff Hartman. Um, uh, oh, God. What was that? that was the Lemonade Stand sketch. Pink Lady and Jeff um, was famously one of, like, the worst ideas for a variety show ever. It was <laughs> this, um, these two wonderful young women from Japan who spoke no English and their cue cards were phonetically written out. Um, a TV show with a wonderful comic named Jeff Altman. And I was part of the backup troupe uh, with Jim Varney and Anna Mathias. Roy was awesome as Tevye. Oh God, I wish I'd seen that. Hi, Jody. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah. So yeah, that's the, that's a lemonade stand sketch. Okay. Oh yeah, that's the, it, that's Jim Varney and Anna Mathias and me. At the end of um, every episode, they would get in a hot tub, like sometimes fully clothed. Which we are <laughs> at hot tub time. I, I mean, it was like I, you can see why it was one of Esquire's most dubious achievement for worst show of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that's hysterical. I love that. Um, Alan Menken and Glenn Slater, who I just work hand in glove with all through the development of Sister Act. And then the tall man behind us is Douglas Carter Bean, who came in later. Wow. It just blows me away that you work with Alan Menken. <laughs> like, well, incredible. Or Alan Menken. And that was opening night, um, London or Broadway? I'm going to say, no, that's opening night, Broadway. Uh, and that's my husband, Bill, and um, and me, and somebody. Um, I, it's a small paper. <laughs> oh, whoopee. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, what am I doing there? It looks like... It has something to do with Santa Barbara. I'm going to see... I, I'm sitting there looking at a script page on my computer, so... But I don't know where I am or who I'm with, but Hi. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's funny. <laughs> I've always got my head in a computer. <laughs> Understood. Well, okay. So that brings me to uh, one other quick question, which is my understanding is that you're you're also an educator now on top of everything else. Is that true? I For the last 12 years, I've been teaching at UC Santa Barbara. Yeah. Oh, and, and what are you teaching? And who do you... I teach writing. Um, and I had a wonderful class for almost 12 years called Hollywood Anatomy of an Industry, where I got to bring all my friends and wonderful people like Alan Menken and Glenn Slater to, um, in to meet the students and have conversations like you and I are having right now. Wow. And so I, I really appreciate your questions and, and, and your skills as an interviewer, because I know how hard this is and I, because I've done it. Oh, wow. Thank you. So, okay, so we have just a few minutes left. So what I guess what I want to say in the time remaining, what I'd like to ask is, first of all, let me say that I, um, you know that I'm, I'm still working with young Americans and writing and directing shows for them and stuff. Um, and so for the benefit of those young people who are now coming through the group and also 
I have an, another project that I work on uh, called the Bleed Performing Arts Experience, where I also work with young people and travel around um, using the arts to inspire and educate and engage and, and unite people. And our motto is embrace the possible. So I'm wondering whether it's that or anything else that you can impart to any young people or the parents of young people who are watching um, who may be interested in some career in entertainment in the arts. Or well, I love <laughs> your motto. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about imagination. And right now I've got a feature film in development that um, is a, that, that, is a time slip romantic comedy with Henry David Thoreau. And so his quote, um, live the life you imagined, I think goes along with embrace the possible. I, I think that, um, you know, go confidently into the dream, live the life you imagined. I think that there are so many times where we kind of stop ourselves short because of imposter syndrome, because it's it all seems so big and far away and, and glamorous. I'm telling you, um, I've had lunch with all these people. They're, they're just, stars are just like us. <laughs> just, I think that really, um, just really trusting your imagination and um, and following the muse is uh, has uh, all I can say is it's worked well for me. Yeah, clearly, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna plan a bug in your ear just for future. <laughs> um, is that I would love if there's ever any opportunity. Um, one of the reasons I came back to start working with with work with young Americans was I wanted to make sure that, because I was pretty confident that, you know, there are lots of talented writers and directors and choreographers and all that that can come and be a part of that. But I wanted to make sure that that magic, that special thing that was the Young Americans wasn't lost and, and continue to be passed on from someone who was fortunate enough to experience it. And so, there's so many times when I'm just sitting down talking to the kids about their future and about life and um, and want to be encouraging. And I'm just just going to plant the bug that maybe at some point, if you're in Riverside County or passing through, that you may want to stop by and uh, if we could set that up to maybe talk to the kids sometime. And yeah. It's a little jot from Santa Barbara, yeah. but, <laughs> but not impossible. And there's also FaceTime and Zoom. I would love to. Oh, I'd be wonderful. Sorry. Wonderful. I would love that. It'd be great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't want to keep you past the hour, I promised. So, because uh, I, I could sit here all day and just too, Bruce. Just go on and on and on. Um, but is there anything else that you want to share? Anything that I left out that you're like, I really would like people to know this? or? Um, Golly. I, I, I feel, I feel complete if you do. Um, and okay. at the same time, if we open another can of worms, we'll be here another hour. <laughs> right. True. 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 And I, let me do this since we, we do have a few seconds left real quickly. I'm just going to people who have left messages while we've been talking. So hi, Karen, one of my friends in Germany. Um, and this is, <laughs> hi, Mr. Bruce, it's Katie. It's one of my believe kids. Um, she is a phenomenal human being, young lady. I think she's going into junior high now. And, uh, but loves Broadway, loves musicals, and so talented and just a wonderful person. Hi, Katie. Uh, so I'm glad you're watching, Katie. And uh, I don't know if you know Celia. Hey, uh, Celia. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Celia. Oh, but now we're friends. If she thinks <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> there we go. Uh, she, she and I started the same year in YAs, and she's not officially my big sister, but she basically is my big sister. Uh, and and here's a dear friend of mine, Dr. Vera Williams. Uh, thank you for watching. Hey, and, and of course, we already kind of said hi to Jody. So hey, Jody. love you, Jody. Thank you. 
And so again, thank you so much for this. I appreciate you. Um, have a wonderful time. If there's ever anything I can do, please let me know. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Bruce, and ditto. All right. Bless you and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Ah, that was awesome. Man, I don't actually have a bucket list, but if I had one, just scratched off one. <laughs> you know, one of the things off my bucket list. That was really, really cool. So um, thank you all for tuning in. If you guys want to keep leaving comments, you can. I'll be happy to uh, go back and respond later. Uh, but anyway, embrace the possible. And uh, since I'm a sci-fi nerd, live long and prosper. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Bye.